The Old Testament reading from Isaiah, the 52nd and 53rd chapters. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Merciful and everlasting God, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all to bear our sins on the cross. Grant that our hearts may be so fixed with steadfast faith in him that we fear not the power of sin, death, and the devil, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The epistle is from Hebrews, the fourth and fifth chapters. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. When Jesus had spoken these words... He went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, 
for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken, to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, And for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. 
Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the Place of the Skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic, But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the... Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. 
But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And another scripture says, They will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As we come to the end of our Lenten journey, we arrive at the cross of Jesus. We've seen him betrayed, beaten, abandoned, and tried. And now he's here, crucified on the cross. Crucifixion was a particularly cruel form of capital punishment. It not only punished the body in ways we can hardly fathom, inflicting incomprehensible pain, but it also punished the mind and the soul. It was meant to humiliate its victim, to lay him bare for the world to see. The Romans used it as a deterrent. It was a death so hideous and so public that it would cause other would-be criminals to think twice, lest they themselves become the cross's next victim. There were many witnesses to the crucifixion of Jesus, but our witness tonight is St. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the gospel writer who also gave us epistles in the New Testament and the book of Revelation. St. John was present with Jesus for some of the most important moments of his ministry. You'll often hear Peter, James, and John, the innermost three of the inner circle. They were special eyewitnesses to Jesus' transfiguration, his raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead, and his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what was St. John getting to witness now? The great Lutheran hymn writer Paul Gerhardt describes it thus. A lamb goes uncomplaining forth, the guilt of sinners bearing, and laden with the sins of earth, none else the burden sharing, goes patient on, grows weak and faint, to slaughter led without complaint, that spotless life to offer. He bears the stripes, the wounds, the lies, the mockery, and yet replies, all this I gladly suffer. John sees a lamb headed to the slaughter. Not only that, but this lamb is weighed down, weighed down by all of our sins. Its back is bowed. It drags itself along. It's bloodied and beaten. It is mere moments away from total collapse. The people looking on shake their heads. It's disgusting to look at. And yet all the same, it keeps marching and marching toward its own death. John, like all of us, knew that Jesus did not deserve what happened to him. He did. We do. That load the lamb was carrying on its back, that was ours. Those stripes, ours. The lies, the mockery, all ours. All of it. All of it carried to the cross by the Lamb of God. And he carries it alone. So often 
in our sins, we think to ourselves, who am I hurting? Look at the lamb. He bears it. And who is this lamb? Gerhardt continues, this lamb is Christ, the soul's great friend, the lamb of God, our Savior, whom God the Father chose to send to gain for us his favor. Go forth, my son, the Father said, and free my people from their dread of guilt and condemnation. The wrath and stripes are hard to bear, but by your passion they will share the fruit of your salvation. Not only did the innocent lamb go to the slaughter for us, but his own father sent him there. His father, who had such mercy on us sinners, who loved us so much despite the evil that we've thought and said and done, that he was willing to give up his own son for us. John saw Jesus transfigured before him. He knew that Jesus was God in the flesh, not just a great prophet or a great teacher or a wonderful rabbi, although certainly he was all of those things. But he was God. He is God. God was going to die to free his people, to free his children who would be lost forever without that sacrifice. Given that charge, how did Jesus respond? Yes, Father, yes. Most willingly, I'll bear what you command me. My will conforms to your decree. I'll do what you have asked me. All of us have rebelled against God. We insist on our own way. We don't help others as we should. We say the things we shouldn't. We know God's plan for our lives and we ignore it. We covet. We lie. And above all else, we put ourselves first. But what of Christ? When he was asked to step into the arena to fight against sin and death and hell itself, where was his heart? Where were his concerns? They were with us. Staring death in the face. Looking the devil himself in the eyes. And the Lord Jesus is worried about us. We were on his mind. Not his own needs, not his own health. He obeyed his father as we never have and never could. He kept the law perfectly. He did everything his Father asked of him, even hanging on a cross for us. At any moment, Jesus could have ended his suffering with a simple word. But he loved us too much for that. And so we ask, O wondrous love, what have you done? The Father offers up his Son desiring our salvation. O love, how strong you are to save. You lay the one into the grave who built the earth's foundation. Think about that. What a reversal. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, dying a common criminal. And for what? For us. What have we done to deserve such kindness? What have we done to deserve such mercy? What have we done to deserve such grace? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. This is an act of love that we fallen sinful people simply are not capable of. We can't do it and we can't understand it. One of Jesus' sayings from the cross was behold Woman, behold your son, behold your mother. Our witness, St. John, was the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was tasked by our Lord with taking his mother Mary into his home to care for her. Even with his last breaths, Jesus looks out with love and concern for the people watching him being crucified. He wants to make sure his mom is going to be taken care of. Only the one who created us 
who knitted us together in our mother's womb could love us this way. Only the Creator could fix His creation. And only the spotless Lamb could pay our debts. And when St. John wrote of the revelation given to him by Christ, he got a glimpse into heaven. He was a witness not only to the crucifixion of Jesus, but to the joys of everlasting life. Listen to what he saw recorded in Revelation 5. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. With seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. When we speak of heaven and the resurrection, we have hope and joy in knowing that all our illnesses of body and mind and soul will be healed. There will be no more mourning or crying or pain for us in that glory. These bodies that are broken down and weary will be resurrected, imperishable and glorious. Jesus was the first born from among the dead and we will follow him into that glory. But although we'll be fully restored in that everlasting joy, there's one who won't be. There's one who even as we sit here tonight still bears the scars on his hands and his side. The same one who appeared to St. John as the lamb who had been slain. Why? Because the debt of our sin had to be paid. There's no forgiveness without sacrifice. There's no life without blood. His scars healed ours. And now this Good Friday, as we stand shoulder to shoulder with St. John and Mary and all the other witnesses to the crucifixion, we end with this hope. Lord, when your glory I shall see and taste your kingdom's pleasure, your blood my royal robe shall be, my joy beyond all measure. When I appear before your throne, your righteousness shall be my crown. With these I need not hide me. And there, in garments richly wrought, as your own bride shall we be brought to stand in joy beside you.